Anyone who's ever seen The Sopranos knows that it's much more than a simple mafia show. Creator David Chase and his team of writers take many of the mob tropes established from movies like The Godfather and Goodfellas and expanded upon them, using the medium of television to exhaustively explore not only the external, criminal, and family life of Tony Soprano, but his inner psychological life as well. To say that The Sopranos was a revolutionary TV show is obvious and an understatement. Never before was there such a creative synthesis that allowed a viewer to dive into the vast inner world of a sociopathic anti-hero from the comfort of their own home. But since The Sopranos, there have been many, and the influence of Chase's show can be seen in a great number of the top flight shows that have preceded it. The emotional complexity of Tony and the depth at which the writers probe into his psyche is, in my opinion, a big part of why The Sopranos still towers over the vast majority of the shows it spawned. By the show's conclusion, Tony's therapy sessions may have only been effective at sharpening his sociopathic traits, but as a viewer, they offered a glimpse at the hypocrisies, contradictions, and vulnerabilities that made Tony human. Tony's scenes with Dr. Melfi are about as close as we ever get to seeing him without the mask or persona of strength that he must don to maintain respect and keep his criminal enterprise afloat. But it's only a glimpse. Tony's fortified ego prevented Dr. Melfi from breaking through to the mobster's true, uninhibited character. As a result, the genuine nature of Tony's character remains a bit of an enigma. One way we can begin to crack the enigma of the true Tony Soprano is to go beyond the realm of the ego and investigate his unconscious mind through his various dreams and hallucinations. Audiences may be divided on the inclusion of dreams in The Sopranos on really any movie or TV show. When we're suddenly thrown into a dream sequence, it can come off as jarring and sometimes even distracting, but in my personal view, the surreal nature of Tony's dreams add a lot of thematic depth to the show, and its subversiveness to the Mafia subgenre contributes to the excellence that separates The Sopranos from other Mafia shows and movies. Sometimes funny, sometimes eerie, and always strange, the dream sequences in The Sopranos are the most realistic I believe I've ever seen in any movie or show. Just like with most of our own dreams, Tony Soprano's dreams are, on their surface, confounding and mysterious. An oversimplified and Reddit-inspired explanation for why dreams are inherently strange and mysterious is that they are ciphered messages sent from your unconscious mind with the purpose of offering us clues to mend rifts and conflicts in our waking lives. Conflicts that may be actively repressed or subconsciously buried, but regardless, stand as obstacles to us becoming the best versions of ourselves. As the notorious psychoanalyst Carl Jung famously said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Dreams are a call from our unconscious to correct our bad ways and habits before they become our fate. The only issue is that dreams communicate to us in a symbolic language that all too often seems impenetrable. That leads many to the conclusion that dreams are just an unexplainable and arbitrary abnormality that isn't worth anything more than a passing thought over our morning coffee. In his book Inner Work, the psychoanalyst Robert Johnson makes the case that with some effort, those symbols are interpretable and if we crack them, we can progress towards individuation, as well as tap into a boundless source of inner wisdom. For Tony Soprano, that inner wisdom came through moments of intuition, communicated from his unconscious mind through his dreams. These moments make for some of Tony's more straightforward dreams, such as the Funhouse dream, where his unconscious mind directs him towards the bitter realization that one of his best friends was an FBI informant. Tony's unconscious used references from The Godfather to effectively communicate this information and to inform him of the actions that had to be taken in the external world as a result. 
This dream is a prime example of the unconscious mind working during REM sleep to solve problems in waking life, and it also displays Tony's trust in the messages sent from his unconscious. Certainly an unusual trait for a TV mob boss. Another interesting nugget from the Funhouse dream is the scene where Tony looks through the binoculars on the boardwalk and watches himself shoot and kill Paulie. In the context of the episode, this clip comes off as a red herring, but when looking back, it appears like another instance of Tony's intuition alerting him to another potential enemy that is yet to reveal himself. In Tony's presence, Paulie plays the role of a loyal lieutenant almost to a sycophantic degree, but as the audience and Tony come to find out, Paulie isn't exactly the most trustworthy member of the family. The Funhouse Dream was David Chase's first major expedition into Tony's unconscious, and it's a significant episode for that reason. But it doesn't really pull back the curtain on Tony's true character and reveal his soft, emotional underbelly in the way we come to see in later seasons. For that, I want to take a look at the Season 5 episode, The Test Dream, in which the dream sequence, which lasts nearly half of the episode's runtime, appears to take a similar path to Funhouse before veering off into some interesting psychological territory. In the episode, Tony is estranged from Carmela and the kids and goes to live in the Plaza Hotel. He goes to see his cousin Tony B to vent out some personal life frustrations. Tony notices that his cousin is acting squirrely and anxious, which tips him off to something being wrong but he doesn't really probe too deeply. What Tony doesn't know is that Tony B's good friend Angelo was just made a casualty in the ongoing conflict within the New York family. Tony B is dead set on avenging Angelo, and that vengeance is bound to put Tony's personal and family life in dire jeopardy. Fully aware of his cousin's unpredictable nature and the fact that he's already suspected of murdering another New York family member, Tony becomes distressed when he learns of Angelo's murder and cannot get a hold of his cousin afterwards. The stress and anxiety throttling Tony from both the professional and family fronts are carried over into his dreams. Tony's unconscious fuses his fears of losing his family and his business. The titular dream begins with Carmine Lupertazzi snuggled next to Tony in bed. Carmine is a significant symbol for Tony and that it was his death that sparked the power struggle within the New York family. Carmine tells Tony how he misses his wife and is lonely on the other side and that it isn't right, introducing two of the major themes of the dream, which are death and alienation from his family. Carmine is the perfect opening symbol for the weirdness that is to come. Tony then gets a phone call presumably from the man upstairs, telling him that our friend has got to go. For the rest of the dream, Tony is shuttled around familiar locations with the vague objective of doing the job, which implies killing his cousin to prevent a war with the New York family. When it comes time to do the job, Tony doesn't have his peace. He's unprepared and can only watch as the catastrophe he fears unfolds. Tony has his peace in the scene when he's on the horse inside the living room negotiating his return home with Carmela. She expresses surprise and concern that Tony still hasn't done the job. The dream then segues into what I think is its most significant sequence, Tony's confrontation with his high school football coach. Coach Molinaro becomes the friend that's gotta go. It's important to remember, as Robert Johnson notes in Inner Work, that in dreams, our unconscious mind will cast certain people from our lives to act as or represent a certain quality or conflict within the dreamer. Judging off the conversation they have, Coach Molinaro appears to be a symbol for a slice of Tony that is deeply mired in regret over choosing the path of organized crime offered to him by his family and peers, and not the path of football, which his heart seems to have been set on from a young age. 
The regret for this choice is amplified by the precarious position Tony now finds himself in in the waking world. This internal voice being played out by the coach scolds him for taking the easy way out. This critical internal voice of Tony's is one that has plagued him throughout his criminal career. We know this because when Tony calls Carmella at the end of the episode, he refers to it as another one of his Molinaro dreams. The best example of this, however, is the way Tony snaps at Uncle June when he says, Your father never had the makings of a varsity athlete. Tony is a hothouse flower about this comment because it pours salt on a still open wound, one he attempts to heal by pushing AJ through football. Tony rationalizes his football failures by citing the significant size differences between him and the other players at Seton Hall. This seems like a reasonable excuse for not following through on his aspirations of playing football, but Tony cannot fool his unconscious mind. In the dream, Molinaro brings up their little secret, the fact that Tony also harbored dreams of following in Molinaro's footsteps and becoming a football coach himself. Tony's ego doesn't deny this, but claims he said that to simply ingratiate himself with the coach. Threatened by the specter of his unlived life, Tony goes on the defensive against Molinaro, falling back upon his materialistic accolades. He cites his $1.2 million house, wife, and family as measures of his worldly success, but we get the sense that the lock to the insecurities of Tony's ego have been picked. As a result, his ego believes that the coach must be killed in order to function and lead his family through the new crisis in the waking world. A flare-up of self-doubt would only hinder his ability to lead. When it comes time for Tony to do the job, he botches it, and the bullets from the falling clip melt in his hand. Just like with the Tony B situation, he was unprepared. The last thing Coach Molinaro says before Tony wakes up is, You'll never shut me up. It's a very rare and haunting peek through the mobster's fortified emotional walls. A relatable one too, as... We all have our regrets that have been set in stone, leaving us only to ponder what could have been. Tony will never silence the regrets of not taking the harder but more authentic path. That die may have been cast, but the dream ultimately compels Tony to rectify another potential regret and seek a reconciliation with Carmela. Despite his depression and regrets, Tony's wife and kids are what keep him anchored to life, and it goes without saying that losing them would pose grave consequences. At the beginning of Season 6, Tony's unconscious runs a simulation of what his life might have looked like if he carved out a legitimate path for himself. The result was the Kevin Finnerty dream that lasted the course of two episodes. The dream occurs while Tony is in a coma, after being shot by Uncle Junior, arguably the peak of his regret for the life he chose. A life that more than likely will send him to the can or to an early grave. Through the dream, Tony's unconscious delivers him the message that if he wishes to exceed the projected lifespan of your average wise guy, he can no longer continue on his current trajectory. But if he can no longer be who he's been, then who is he, and where is he going? In the dream, we are introduced to Anthony Soprano. He's not the Tony that we've come to know over the course of six seasons. The dream Anthony has shed his thick New Jersey accent and works as a precision optics salesman. But the true identity crisis occurs when he arrives at a sales conference and realizes he's carrying the wallet and briefcase of another man, Kevin Finnerty another salesman who bears a resemblance to Anthony. Anthony can't find his briefcase that contained his entire life. And so, he gradually adopts the identity and life of Kevin Finnerty. And that doesn't come without consequences. We learn that Finnerty, despite wearing a facade of legitimacy, 
is actually kind of a shady character who sells faulty heating equipment to a temple of Buddhist monks before hitting a Houdini on them. In the context of the dream, I believe that Anthony Soprano, the precision optics salesman, is the true Tony, what could have been if he had been born perhaps under different circumstances or if he didn't opt to take the easy way out. And Kevin Finnerty is the morally dubious Tony Soprano. A very interesting, subtle detail from the dream appears during Tony's phone calls to his wife back at home. Judging off of her voice, it isn't Carmela. There's been some dispute over who exactly voices Anthony's wife in these two episodes, but I've always thought it was the voice of Charmaine Bucco. I don't believe there's ever been confirmation on that, but if it was Charmaine, it would make thematic sense as... Charmaine was an old flame of Tony's who made the deliberate choice of a crime-free life. It would also support the notion of the precision optic salesman being the Tony of potential. Anthony's eventual diagnosis of Alzheimer's peels back another layer of the identity crisis theme. He begins considering the idea that he might actually be Kevin Finnerty. I believe that Finnerty specifically represents the persona of Tony Soprano, the criminal, the mobster. Just like how Tony adopted the identity of a mobster from his father and his uncle, he takes the easy way out and adopts Kevin Finnerty's identity. In his waking life, it leads to his uncle shooting him, and in the dream, it leads to an impending lawsuit and a death sentence of a medical diagnosis. With the Finnerty family reunion, his unconscious is presenting him with a crucial choice. The presence of Tony B, the specter of his mother, and the symbolism of the setting make it plainly clear that if Anthony is to continue on as Kevin Finnerty, his hard cut to black will come prematurely. What wakes Tony up from his coma are the distant calls from Meadow. Tony Soprano is more than a mobster. Despite his shortcomings and his infidelities, he loves his family, especially his children. They're what fuel his new mantra of every day being a gift. The message Tony's unconscious ultimately offered him was simple, change or die. The door to Tony becoming a football player or a coach was closed. But the potential for him to become a better person for himself and his family was there. And he initially worked to fulfill it. But as we know, Tony drifted away from his mantra of every day being a gift and, in my opinion, became an even more vile and malicious person until his fateful dinner at Holstein's. I always found it kind of sad that Tony couldn't reform himself after his near-death experience, it conjured up the question of free will for me. Did Tony actually have the capability to escape his circumstances, or was his fate sealed by taking the easy way out at a young age? You're born to this shit. You are what you are. A mysterious quote pinned in Tony's hospital room may provide some insight into that query. Sometimes, I go about in pity for myself, and all the while, a great wind carries me across the sky. From my view, this quote seems to suggest a lack of free will. It carries a cosmic connotation, but besides going through the motions of organized faith, Tony isn't a spiritual person. When he sees it, it actively annoys him as does the evangelical preacher that comes to visit him throughout his hospital stay. A possible secular interpretation of that great wind referenced in the quote is as the gravitational pull that Tony's peers and role models had on him at the age where Coach Molinaro said he had tremendous potential. Going back to the test stream for a moment, Coach Molinaro blames the tarnishing of that potential on the people he spent time with. He always hung around with the wrong crowd, and he never stopped doing so. 
This made me think of a common motif of Tony's dreams, that of being driven around in his father's car. In the test dream in particular, the car is occupied by a revolving door of dead peers, driving him to his various jobs. Molinero specifically singles out Artie Bucco as being their ne'er-do-well in chief, distracting Tony from football. This could explain Tony's confusion at the end of the test dream as to why Artie was the only living friend in a car full of dead guys. Tony's great wind were the family members that drove him to an unfulfilling life of wasted potential and very likely to an early death. Ultimately, the dreams of Tony Soprano showcased another dimension of the character and revealed many essential truths and defining anxieties that otherwise would have remained internal. In my opinion, the courage of David Chase to delve deeply into Tony's dreams is one of the reasons why I feel that The Sopranos is the greatest show ever made. He peeled back the surface from a guarded tough guy and revealed his vulnerabilities and doubts, the same ones that made him human. He showed us Tony Soprano cast in a tragic light, a man racked with regret and doomed to follow his chosen path to its logical conclusion. <laughs>